Actually, my talk is called Engineering Delight. Many of you will know the words commodity, firmness and delight that Sir Henry Wootton came up with in 1624 to translate the words that Vitruvius had written in his De Architecture Libri Decem, the ten books on architecture. Over the years, both architects and engineers have referred to these qualities and argued about their relevance or even the accuracy of the translation. My own view is that they are quite a good general summation of what we try to achieve when we develop projects for our built environment. We want them to perform well, to be durable and reliable, of course, but in, if in addition they can also bring delight, then they can really be considered to be successful. Increasingly, it has become obvious that in order to achieve this, we who are involved in these projects have to be good collaborators. Without doubt, the most successful projects that I have worked on have resulted from the best collaborations between clients, stakeholders, all the members of the design team and the builders. When I think about collaboration, I think about exchanging ideas with like-minded people where we both respect and trust each other and with whom I share common goals. Inevitably, the process of collaboration will also include a shared sense of humour. I'm showing you this photo of the Kenwood Ladies Pond in Hampstead Heath, where I swim two or three times a week throughout the year, because it's one of those places where I can both practice mindfulness, where I concentrate totally on the moment and the sensations of being in the water, surrounded by nature, and where I also sometimes experience a state of what some psychologists call flow, a kind of complete absorption. It's a bit like the feeling that we get on the best projects, where everything comes together. The client, design team and contractor truly act as one. Of course, this happens rather rarely, but if we can savour those moments, I'm sure that they gradually infect the way we work and interact with others. You may have heard that in 1972, the King of Bhutan said we should measure the success of society as much by measuring the gross national happiness quotient, the GNH of the nation, as by measuring the gross domestic product, or GDP. And the Swiss economists, Bruno Freyen and Alois Stutzer, have been writing about what economists could learn from happiness research since the late 1990s. I was a member of a think tank at the RIBA called Building Futures. We looked at what might be happening in the built environment in 20 to 50 years' time. So I proposed the topic of building happiness. That is, how does or can the way in which we design our built environment affect our psyche? After arranging a seminar and a debate on the subject, we decided that the subject was broad enough to justify a book, which I edited. It's a collection of essays by practitioners and researchers in the built environment, as well as some short pieces by well-known people about places that really give them delight. I think this book shows that there are many ways of thinking about what the effects of what we uh, construct can be on our ability or likelihood to feel happy or sad. At the same time, a number of consistent threads emerge. People are happier if they feel engaged with how their local community is run. If the way we design their physical space encourages this, then so much the better. How we feel about a place is affected by many things. As the landscape architect Martha Schwartz says, although a visit to the Grand Canyon is thrilling, her childhood memories mean that her backyard rates higher as a happy place. There are benefits to being generous in the design of spaces that allow for social interactions. Students suffer if their rooms open onto long corridors with no windows. It matters if strangers can walk past your bedroom window. And of course, the physical conditions of daylight, warmth and noise all play a part. As it becomes more obvious that increasing GDP will inevitably lead to more consumption of our planet's scarce resources, it becomes increasingly more important that we are careful with how we spend those resources on our built environment and that we can concentrate more on how the way in which we design that environment in impacts on our emotional well-being. In the following projects, I will try to describe how we, together with the clients and architects, did our best to develop solutions that would bring a smile to those who will experience them. And I will try to describe the collaborative processes that led to the evolution of the designs, how the ideas emerged and were developed. 
So one of the longest uh, collaborations I've had over the years has been with the architects David Marks and Julia Barfield. And when I was in um, Arabs Los Angeles office, I got a, a fax from them. This was in about 99, ask, 89, sorry, asking if I'd like to collaborate with them on, a, on a, an ideas competition called The Bridge of the Future. And, oh, it's jumping. It, and it, and it, we came up with the idea of um, a bridge that's modelled on what Darcy Thompson called the, the quadrupedal bridge of an animal, the four-legged <coughs> animal, where your, your, the bones take the compression and the tendons govern the deflections. So the bridge um, is fixed on one side, and at the, on, on the right-hand side, it's just supported vertically. So the idea is that, it, um, that this kind of... Oops. This point here can kind of slide sideways as people go over it. I was kind of influenced by the idea of those very primitive um, um, string bridges, pretty well, rope bridges, that move as you go along them. The co collaborative process was us kind of sending faxes back and forwards to each other. So this is the idea of the vertebrae, which are connected together. Um, and um, although that wasn't a bridge that got built, it was really the start of our, our conversation. When I came back to England, um, we worked on this project in Liverpool, which is a, a water sports activity centre. And um, it's, it's, it's set into the Princess Dock, and there, there are paths that go down to the bottom of the dock. And then the idea is that this platform is the wet level, and the columns are set back from the edge, so you can bring in canoes and um, wind surfboards. And then you go up t to the main level, which you access from the land at the, at, by this bridge. And, there, and there, the, the, the vertical supports are moved to the outside. So we've got these frames that go across um, um, the whole building. And so you've got more space at the top. Um, and it, it was a tight budget. We thought, actually, it might have been cheaper to try and use uh, a converted barge. But in fact, that would have been much more expensive. We only had a budget of £1 million. And, and using barges would have cost the whole of, of that budget. So we, we put some money into just two castings at the top here, where these big columns divide into the branches, and then little castings at the top. Interestingly, the steel fabricator was a company called Tube Workers, who don't exist anymore, but they were the people who made Stansted Airport. And then um, I got another phone call, and David said that they wanted to enter this competition for a millennium landmark that the Architecture Foundation and the, Sun, and the uh, Sunday Times launched. It was an ideas competition, and David had come up with the idea of building the world's largest observation wheel, and Julie had spotted this site beside County Hall. And because um, it's um, on Jubilee Walk, which we had to keep free, we decided to support it from one side and cantilever it over the water, cause we, and we didn't want, obviously, to put a leg down into the water. So that's why it's got a cantilevered spindle. And they really wanted something that would be of the future. I don't think they really wanted anything between the spindle and, and, and the rim, but of course that's impossible. I did actually try just having one half of this stiff arm, um, but that really didn't work. So, so in our first design, we had this just one beam going right the way across. But the trouble with that was that it meant that the, the rim had to span halfway round the circle. So it was a very heavy element. Well, nobody won this competition, but David's uh, late father said, well, this is a project that could be successful if you could get someone to fund, fund it, and then it would make money. So that's that we started the process, and they met um, Bob Ayling, who used to be chief executive of British Airways, who funded the studies to get to planning permission. And um, at that stage, I said, well, let's go back to a more efficient structure, which is modelled on the bicycle wheel, which is kind of magical tensegrity structure where the compression elements, the rim and the spindle, are only connected by tension elements. Now on a bicycle, the weight all comes down from the spindle and it kind of pushes, the, tries to push the circle into a horizontal oval and it's actually the horizontal spokes that keep the wheel circular. So that's quite amazing, that's very thin horizontal elements are resisting the main vertical load. So our wheel's different, the main load comes from the rim, so that would tend to put it into a vertical oval, and it's the vertical that cables that are keeping it circular. And um, the other thing we have to worry about is wind load. So we've got some cables that are going to, to either end of the spindle, so when the wind blows, the ones that are on the windward side, they 
pick up more tension and the ones on the leeward one side get, tend to go slack and you have to make sure that none of the cables go slack otherwise the whole thing would collapse so we had to pre-stress it so we tighten up all the cables so that both under vertical loads and wind loads they never go slack and that meant of course that you're putting an awful lot of compression into the rim so one of the biggest issues we had to deal with was to stop that rim from buckling and you'll have seen a bicycle wheel that buckles where two quarters kind of come towards you and two go apart and so all of that governed the size of that triangular truss that is the rim. It's a long story and I could tell the whole lecture about this, so I won't. I'm jumping now to when it was being put up. So the project actually went design and build and um, um, uh, Hollandia took over the design sort of when we got to quite a detailed stage, stage E+. Plus. And they decided to erect it by building it horizontally over the river and then lifting it up. Of course, the wheel was not designed to have all of its load horizontally to its face. So that's why you can see here a lot of temporary cables that connect from the tip of the spindle to the rims all the way around. So this crane picks up the bottom of the spindle, which pushes it up there, and then all of these cables then evenly pick up the rim. So it was lifted up. And at this stage, it's, the wheel is in the same plane as the A-frame that supports it and then after a week they pulled down the back of the spindle so the spindle went horizontal and the wheel went vertical. And you can see there's no capsules on it at this stage so they just got the, 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 the main structure up and then they could attach the capsules by floating them down from the river and at, attach them at the lower end. And a huge amount of the effort of getting this project to get planning permission was to do with making sure that it would be beautiful. And a lot of that was to do with the, these <coughs> capsules and the fact that the glass is doubly curved. <coughs> so that's it. And even though it has got all of those cables, it is actually very transparent. I was quite lucky. I got a chance to go up inside this leg and then onto this platform and then up this ladder, ladder, and this is before they actually put hoops around it, that was the scariest moment. And then you could go into the spindle, and then you can actually inspect, there's two, there's two kind of uh, braces of um, huge uh, roller bearings, like ball bearings. So e everything about this wheel can be inspected, so it's probably the, the safest fairground ride you'll ever see. And this was a project that was all about bringing delight, uh, and also, I love the fact that there were probably thousands of people who were involved in the design and construction of this project who could all say to their mum, I was involved in this. Um, this is one of our many office um, outings um, where we'd go up in the wheel. So this was probably the last main project that I worked on in Arabs. Um, and this next project, this is the treetop walkway at Kew Gardens, and it's another project with David and Julia. Um, they got onto the framework agreement at Kew and um, the head arboriculturist, who's called Tony Kirkham, had had this temporary walkway uh, made out of scaffolding to, to show people uh, about how good trees are for the planet. And it, this, it, this was going through the redwoods and it was very, very popular. So he decided to try and fundraise and have a, a permanent walkway built and I was very lucky to be part of the team. Um, the site is um, this site in these woods n near, the, uh, n near this temperate gallery. And um, originally this was a wood laid out by Capability Brown. It's actually changed enormously over the years. And um, Julia and I walked around with Tony and we discussed what the walkway should be like. It shouldn't be competing visually with the trees. It should be enabling you to go up and see the tree canopy. And we discussed what materials we would use. Um, and although timber might have been nice, it, because um, Tony felt that the walkway should be 18 metres above ground, so you'd be right in the canopy, it would have been very heavy structure. So we said we we'll probably would use steel. And then the issue is what colour would you paint the steel so it doesn't stick out like a sore throat, you know, being surrounded by nat natural colours. So um, I suggested weathering steel, otherwise known as Corten, that's uh, the brand name. And uh, Tony was happy with that. Um, and it was a chance, really, that I hadn't properly appreciated. But you can only get weathering steel in plates. You can't get rolled sections. 
and this was brilliant because it meant that I wasn't forced by the quantity surveyor to just use circular hollow sections for the pylons, <coughs> that it had to be fabricated. And also we had a lot of discussion about, the, um, ab about what the structure should be and we settled quite quickly on the idea of having just pylons at regular spacings and having just tr using the handrails as trusses that would span between the pylons. Um, but there are lots of ways you can make a truss. Basically, a truss needs a compression element at the top, a tension element at the bottom, that takes the bending, and then diagonals that carry the shear. And the diagonals don't all have to be at the same angle. So we discussed different ways of doing that. I mean, you could have had loads and loads of di diagonals very close together like this, so that that, that, that would provide the 100 mil uh, maximum <coughs> gap that you need for, for a balustrade. Um, or you could have s something more random and um, and in the end, well, um, Mark Spalfield found that, that a good material to use would be Expermet, which is this mesh that would be very transparent, but the holes are tiny, and then the structure could really just be what we needed it to be. But the other thing was that, of course, architects all love the Fibonacci sequence because it occurs in nature. So the sequence is it's 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5. And so we kind of wondered how we could use this. And so we decided to use it as the spacing of the intersection of the diagonals with the bottom and top booms. But if, so that's the Fibonacci sequence, that's to the center of the, of the truss. Of course, if we joined all of these dots, we'd have far more diagonals than we needed. So actually, Julie and I just sat down. I said, let's not have more than three diagonals <coughs> coming to a point. And then we just played around with a pattern of diagonals that satisfied that rule until we liked the look of it. And then said the, the other half would be this, but just flipped over the other way. So it gives a, n a random appearance, but actually is based on a logic. And then, as I was saying about the pylons, because they had to be fabricated, we could um, uh, have a, a, a tapered cross-section. And... Actually, for, for um, not buckling, the, the most efficient cross-section is a circle, but to have a, a tapered c cone would be very expensive. But to make, so the next best shape against buckling is a triangle, and so that's what we went for. So it, so it tapers from, from the bottom at 1.3 metres, and then where, where it divides into three branches down to 525, five, five, and then gets very narrow at the top. So that's, so that's the final design that went in for planning. And then, of course, we had to... Oh, and I didn't mention about... We've got these passing nodes, which are circles, um, which are th three metres wide, and it's wide enough so you can have a, a wheelchair passing... A, uh, just one wheelchair passing a person. But the other big issue was about the foundations. So <coughs> trees have a trunk, and then they have the main radial roots, <coughs> which provide stability, and then they have a whole load of fibrous roots that gather water and nutrients. And all of that occurs pretty well in the top metre of soil. So Tony was happy that we could do a radar survey to see where the radial roots were and put piles in between those main roots. But he wasn't happy with the thought that we would have a big pile cap that would just wipe out all of those radial roots. So to stop a cantilever falling over with wind in any direction, you need a minimum of four piles so that it doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing. If you had three piles, it might work, but then one of the piles might have double the load of the other two, so four is the optimum. Um, and they've got to be connected to the bottom of the pylon with something that's stiff enough so that it, so that it all <coughs> doesn't um, bend, it, that, that it has something that's stiff enough to be a rigid object. That's what a pile cap is, and it's normally a metre deep. So this was, and then, so this was a bit of a disaster, and we couldn't put it on top of the ground. This is a plywood mock-up of, of a pile cap because the architects hated what that looked like. So um, instead, we suggested that we connect the piles together with a steel grillage. So each of those steel beams is a very heavy section fabricated and only 350 mil uh, square. So that could be threaded... Um, a rat, uh, that would just be, be, be threaded over the radial roots and only wipe out a small amount of the fibrous roots, which could then grow back. And you can see that each, each of these grillages is going to be different depending on where the roots are. <coughs> the other 
big conversation we had. This is David Marriott, who was the steel fabricator, and he was fantastically um, helpful and enthusiastic about the project. And he got on very, very well with Tony Kirkham and all the tree surgeons who were needed to kind of pull branches out of the way. Um, and, but there, we had a big discussion with him because he thought it would be easy to make it if the flat side of the triangle then folded out to make the side of the branch. But I really didn't want that. I wanted it to be the vertex of the triangle that was the line that you saw being folded out as in this cardboard model. So in the end, we had our way and we're, that's what we got. So I'm just going to flick through now some of the um, construction shots. This is, um, so this is all the bolts connecting the base of the pylon to the top of the grillage. And that's one of the grillages. Here's another one. And actually, they've, they've, they're, this is connecting to, there's a copper strip that goes down so that it, it's erst because it, for, for lightning. And you can see this completely different shaped grillage. And this one had more piles because of it. And then this is it being lifted up. In some ways, I think it was the most beautiful at this stage before we put the walkway on. But we, I was very happy with how that looked. And then this is the walkway coming on. The, each each uh, section of walkway that's dropped in has a pin that's going through a circular hole at one end <coughs> and a slotted hole at the other end to allow each bit of walkway to expand and contract as the temperature changes. When it first went up, some of the branches were very close. Sadly, they've, they've cut them all back, so there's no chance for someone to do some tree climbing from the walkway. And you can see how transparent the, um, the mesh is. That's Tony Kirkham at the opening. And parents like it because kids can look through the floor on the side, and so they're not tempted to try and climb up over the, the balustrade to see out. Halfway around, there's a bigger <laughs> node where they can have a class of like 30 kids. That's it from below. And gradually, this weathering seal is looking really good against the trees. Um, and another project with David and Julia is, um, is, a, is a children's hosp hospice in Q8. Um, we didn't actually work on the building, but we worked with them on this series of structures which climb up over the, over the buildings. So it's a very hot climate, so they need to... Um, they, they need to have a canopy over, over where you walk. So this, this is like a sinusoidal um, wave that just supports a walkway that then climbs up and then bridges over the buildings. And I've used the triangular cross-section again for this arch and then hangers. And you can see this is a perforated metal for the balustrade and it's got um, the pattern of um, some characters from a Q80 children's book. It made into the perforations. So this is a tied arch. So that's the tie, and that's the, that's the compression element. <coughs> this is our early diagram of all the different structures. So this is, this is the walkway, which is supported by these arching structure, and that's the canopy over it. There. And just some more. And there's also a little wheel. Um, which is e each of those um, uh, capsules is big enough for two wheelchairs and two adults. And that's the client. So again, we had a brilliant client. She's the wife of the Minister of Health. Her name's Margaret Alsaya. And um, she, she had cut, she's Scottish, actually, and she'd come over and she'd seen the wheel and the cute treetop walkway, which is why she said she wanted the same team. And... Um, um, Oh, I've just, we, we collaborated with an Austrian firm, a steel fabricator, whose name I've just forgotten, sorry. Um, but th they're the people who did the, that lovely bridge that connects the um, Royal Ballet to the Opera House. Wagner Bureau. Another architect I've collaborated with quite a bit um, is David Chipperfield. Um, I know who I met when I was at Arabs. In fact, worked in very early days on the Noise Museum competition with him. And when I left, um, it was quite fortunate for me because he had a lot of projects abroad. It, to start with, it was just me plus one or two collaborators. And he was having to collaborate with firms in the country where the projects were being <coughs> built. So it was fine that I also collaborated with engineering firms. So on, on this project, which is the Venice Cemetery Island, um, 
an extension to it, but also filling in this first bit. Um, I was able to uh, choose a very nice firm of engineers uh, uh, and a person called Romeo Scarpa, not the architect, um, to, to collaborate with. So they did the foundations and the detail design and we did the scheme design. So this cemetery is uh, obviously all, all, the, um, all the bodies have to be above ground level because of the water. And um, this part of the pro project is, is basically like um, bookshelves that the coffins go into. And then after about 10 years, um, they take the coffins out and they put the bones into smaller boxes. And then after another certain number of years, depending on how much you pay, there's the, all the bones just go into a nursery. Um, and then the second part of the phase of the project, which they're just starting to do now, is to build this extra new bit of island. And the first bit of the cemetery has got a wall all the way around it, so it's quite um, an introverted space. The second bit will be different. It'll have steps going down to the water. <coughs> but really, we were just involved in the first phase. So that's that wall I was talking about. And here you can see the layout of, of these... There's, so they're like uh, little courtyards and cloisters. Again, because it's hot, it's good to have some shade. Um, and <coughs> so this is a section through. This is where the coffins go, and then this is this kind of um, cloister-type roof to give, protect you from the sun. And, um, and Romeo designed the foundations, the piles. So it's very soft <laughs> soil um, under the lagoon and then it goes down to a bit more hot, stiffer clay. So they, they actually make these interesting piles where they, they, um, they kind of um, uh, put down a tube and then ex uh, excavate out the soil. And then they, they take out more soil at the bottom and put the concrete in. And it makes like an elephant's foot, so it spreads out the load over a wider area. So this is um, it finished. And another project we did with David is the studio for Anthony Gormley uh, in uh, north of King's Cross. And it's very, in a way, it's a very simple shed. Mostly it's um, double height space for the three central bays. And then the end bays have a, have a floor in at the first floor level. Um, so the, the, the design conditions are very different for those two bits. So in, in the double height space, you've got, you've got um, columns that are, are double height, and they also pick up a crane rail that goes across. So you've got a lot of wind on that. Here, the columns are propped at the first floor level, so they have less horizontal load on them. Also, there's this cantilevered out big um, landing for this staircase. And you'll notice that where the column might be here, above a window, it can't go <coughs> through the window, so we have a transfer beam. And yeah. Um, David and Anthony wanted the walls to be completely flat, both on the inside and the outside. So we have a steel structure that's buried in within these walls, and then there's block work uh, over all of it to make it um, look uh, smooth. And these are typical um, Chipperfield stairs where um, we're using the, bal the, the sides as trusses that span from top to bottom, which means that the treads can just be open. So <clears throat> this is our, 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 our drawing, and here's the double height um, columns, and that's where the crane rail is. Um, so you can see the double height space there and the crane rail at the top here. <coughs> and that's the <coughs> stairs that can just, they're just, those treads just span between the two um, side trusses that are covered over with that she with the sheet of galvanised steel, and then here's the big cantilever beam supporting that big landing. And another project we did with David was BBC Scotland in Glasgow, and this was a competition um, which we did with, with him, uh, and my tiny firm wasn't allowed to be the main engineers, so I, I was allowed to choose someone from the framework agreement, so we were subbed to faber Monsell. so it was quite nice for us. We did the design of um, the superstructure up to stage D, and then we did the design, the detailed design of the studios, which are underneath this atrium space that climbs up, and then there's a huge studio at the far end, um, and then we also did the detailed design of the roof. Um, so it's an interesting project. This is where the, um, the big studio is, and the structure at this end, there's actually, um, full height trusses in behind that zone. 
because this studio had to be what's called box-in-box -box construction. So there couldn't be any floors above the studio or the sounds would be transferred. So we had one set of trusses and, uh, interleaved with another set of trusses. So the top set of trusses support the structure above and the bottom set of trusses support the ceiling of the studio, which also had to carry heavy loads like lights and scenery and all sorts of other things. Within the atrium, <coughs> those studios, they are also um, on, on, on bearings. And then the floor slabs, which are a nine metre grid, they all had to be designed to carry different sorts of loading. So in one area, it was like a library, the archive of all the of reels and all sorts of everything. Other area might just be plain office. And another area would have to have what's called nested offices. So small little um, studios, sorry, nested studios, small little studio booths, which could be put anywhere on the floor plate. So, it, so it's, a, a fl um, it's a flat concrete slab everywhere apart from above the main studio and concrete columns. And it was a very robust design, although it looks, it looks kind of very simple. And that was quite good because it did go design and build after stage D. Um, and the architect wasn't novated, the engineers were. But it meant that the, the, ish, the, the essence of the design was managed to stand. Well, I did also, I'm just going to show a little bit of work with Zaha. Um, uh, so I, I do owe a huge debt of gratitude, firstly, to Peter Rice, who uh, was an engineer at Arabs, who sadly died in, <coughs> I think it was in 92. And um, he'd been a kind of mentor. He was, um, he was an unusual person. He was, uh, he was the main engineer on Centre Pompidou and worked with piano, um, Renzo Piano and, and Richard Rogers. And I think he liked unusual people, so by dint of being a female, I qualified. And, <laughs> uh, and I wasn't ever in his group, but occasionally I'd get a call from him and say, I think you should work on this. So I got a call say, from him saying he thought I should work on this project with Zaha, which was a project in Dusseldorf that she'd won a competition for. It didn't actually get built, but it was a collection of um, buildings above ground, beside the, uh, the Rhone, uh, so very high fluctuations in uh, water table level and it actually had three levels of um, shops and parking below and that had to get reduced because it was too expensive to stop the whole thing floating because it just had these finger-like buildings above, one of which was offices, two of which were offices and one was a hotel. Um, uh, and this is like a, co a collection of buildings where it's almost like you, if you squeeze on the outer ones, the one, the one in the middle could be um, cantilevering forward. So we're looking at ways to kind of try to support this. And it was, for me, it was a project where we, oh, here's the river where you can see the range of, her uh, tidal range. It was a project where we tried to find a way of um, coming up with design solutions which wouldn't stop her process, which is very holistic. So it was all working with physical models. I would say this, this, these were her analog days where, the phys where most of the design development was made with physical models and mostly with um, sheets of card so they would just have single curvature, not double curvature like the more recent <coughs> projects which, are, which are, you know, use much more kind of parametric development. And, uh, but nevertheless, something would change in, uh, in one building and all the rest would change as well just because of the kind of the sculptural analysis, I suppose, that she was doing. So we would come up with rules like sort of saying, well, the columns don't have to be on a rectangular grid, but if they're this spacing apart, then the slab will be this thick. And if there are different spacing, there'll be a bit more. And if you go beyond that, you'll have to put in a beam. And columns didn't have to be vertical, but they should be a straight line from the roof down to the ground. And things like that helped us to come up with, um, so this is another one where we're giving rules. And then they would take those rules and explore them, both with, with these kind of drawings or paintings and with the models. Um, and then this was how to deal with this building that had big long cantilever at both ends. So one option would be to put a truss at the top, <coughs> which we've got here. In the end, we suggested making each of the faces into a kind of multi-leveled virandil. So it's really a punctured wall that can cantilever. And then this is their models exploring what that would look like. So that was a good process that we went through. Here's one with a, a whole collection of uh, columns that look more like sticks. So she didn't mind having columns, but kind of didn't want them to look like columns. 
And then we worked on the Cardiff Opera House competition, which is a huge saga in itself. Um, one of the main things about it was that the main auditorium should, didn't need to be symmetrical. And so it, um, this was you know, one of the pictures exploring what it would be like. Um, the main idea of the project was that the, um, this is the auditorium and this back building has in it the fly tower, which is kind of disguised. And then these arms, which wrap around a central space, contain all the offices and the rehearsal rooms. And the idea was that this, um, oh, and also the main auditorium was lifted a bit above the ground. So people could, from, could wander in uh, and wander around this space at ground level and go down below ground a bit as well, a bit like in the Dusseldorf project and that these arms were lifted above ground and that you could hear people rehearsing, the sounds would spill out. And I think it's such a terrible shame that the project they ended up with was you know, basically a huge blob where all the people who work in it are buried inside. And here it was much more about the people who work there actually having access to windows and being able to see out. So this was one of the study models, she called it a necklace that would be wrapped around the auditorium. And this, again, how you could walk around at the ground level more studies <laughs> and these amazing models that um, um, I think it was Tarant who made these the way that the, um, the, the auditorium is sliced in half <coughs> so you could see look inside and see what it'd be like and then the structure I mean we were told oh well, this is too expensive but actually the structure was pretty straightforward we had these kind of radial <coughs> radial um, lines of beams that would pick up the um, the, the, the seating it was just, there was, there were squiffy shapes, but they weren't, it wasn't rocket science at all. So as you can see, the cross section is really fairly straightforward. Well, so that didn't get built. This is a tiny project that did. This is um, the Maggie Centre in Kokordi. Um, and this is the leftover space that we were given. Uh, this is a gulch that runs through the, the, the hospital campus. There's this ugly building behind and a car park here. Um, and actually there's a, there's a water outflow and there was a sewer going under the site. <coughs> so there's, there's the outflow there. So Zaha decided to turn her back on that ugly building in the car park. And this is, this is a, a shape that's made out again of folded <coughs> card. It's very much inclined in either direction. So there, there wasn't much stability in this direction. So we actually buried it in, in, in the, the walls inside. Oh, oops. Um, are curved as well, but we buried in them some columns that we joined up with beams in the roof to make portal frames in this direction. And then in, in these side walls, we have trusses buried that can provide the stability from front to back. Also, we made it so that we could pile from the top flat area and then just cantilever forward. So, and there were these no-go zones where the sewer, sewer and the outflow were. So our our piles had to avoid that. We had ground beams spanning over them. And these are, these are the internal walls that we buried the, um, the columns in. So this is actually a true plan. So you can see how much these side walls are leaning. And then the, <coughs> our, these are the row of columns here, here, and here that we connected to the roof beams. And those columns at the front and back also double those mullions. And that's the side elevation of our trusses. And then this is just the structure going up. And then it's just clad in very simple timber. And this is the opening day. So now, very different sort of architect who I really love working with is Peter Beard um, of Landrum. I met him first teaching at Cambridge and then at the AA. And this is a project which is um, a really a footbridge that goes down from the top of, there's a, this, this is Raynham, this is the village of Raynham over here, and the River Thames is over here, and the, the high speed one cuts off Raynham from the marshes, and there's a very ugly footbridge over, over the railway. So this is a walkway that goes from the top of the footbridge straight down to the marshes. And um, I, years ago had worked on a project in Atlanta that didn't get 
built, unfortunately. It was just it was to be in the Olympics uh, as a kind of kiosk. And um, we were using timber columns that were all at different angles and that didn't meet at a point. And they, they were supporting a roof that was a timber space frame that had a lot of bending stiffness. So if you have columns at lots of different angles and then you have a bending stiff element on top, then when you try and push it sideways, it's stable because of the combination of the bending stiffness of this plate and the columns at different angles. And I'd always wanted to try this out. So that's what we've done on this walkway. So these columns, they look very random. They connect the cross beams. Their cross beams are every three meters. And on one beam, it'll be on the left hand side and the next beam will be on the right hand side. And then the column is at 15 degrees to the vertical and its foot will be in one of four positions. So it looks quite random, but in fact, there's that rule that's there. And then, and the columns are made out of timber and Peter wanted them to be as close to real tree trunks as possible. So they basically they taper from 600 to 450 at the top and we took off the bark and as little much else as possible. So they're solid timber. Um, at the top they're 18 metres long and they get shorter obviously at the bottom. And then, they, and then the, the walkway itself is made of this steel ladder that you can see plus um, metal decking and a concrete topping. There were quite a few complications. One is that there's a little road going underneath it. And then we also found out that there are a lot of underground services that hadn't really been properly mapped until we really insisted that they were. Um, so that's why you don't have columns everywhere. And this is just showing you plan on the walkway. So you can see how the columns are going to one of four spaces at the bottom. And then it lands at the bottom end on, uh, there's, there's an earth ramp that's built up and that's retained by this concrete wall. And then this is Peter's study model at the top end of how it attaches to the footbridge. And that's, the, again, the planning, the section through it. So this, this drawing shows at the top, this is the walkway. And then um, this is showing um, there's a waterway and the road that goes underneath it. And then this is the elevation. And this is the services no-go zones, which is the nightmare. So you can see that we've only got these little bits of pile cap that we can use to connect the feet of the columns together. And we were quite worried about wobbly bridge syndrome. So if the whole lot could have had one nice long pile cap underground connecting all the feet together, it would have been pretty stiff. But because some of those sections of the pile cap were so small, we really had to be careful. So we had to actually model the piles themselves going down through quite a bit of softish ground to, <coughs> thicker gra to stiffer ground and m actually model them as springs to make sure that the whole thing <coughs> didn't um, vibrate too much. What, we found, what was found out after the Wobbly Bridge um, s scenario was that when you walk, you impart a small horizontal force, and that's what could set up the horizontal um, oscillations in the bridge. And basically, if, if you can make sure that the natural frequency is above 1.3 hertz, which is sort of the likely um, uh, fastest that everybody would be wa walking at, then you'll, then you'll be all right. So we had to do a lot of analysis to make sure that we were above that magic number. And this is kind of looking, this is an exaggerated deflected shape, don't panic. And we also had to look at the, um, at the, def uh, the deflections, sorry, the, the, this, this one's the, def the um, natural frequency and this one's deflections under wind loads. And we had to make sure under wind loads that we didn't deflect more than height divided by 180. So we were fine on that that it was the natural frequency. And we found that which position of those four positions we chose for each column base made quite a difference to the stiffness. So we had to go through systematically optimizing it. And then um, there's, there's um, a German engineer called Peter Bircher who developed a very good um, way of connecting timber to steel. And he basically inserts into the end of the timber a, a cast steel rod and then puts in steel dowels that go through and that's connected to a proper ball bearing. So we as near as possible have a pin at the bottom of the column and similarly at the top. 
so that we're not putting ex extra bending into those columns. There's a bit of bending we had to design the columns for because they're not going to be perfectly straight because the, how they, a, because they're from trees and also because you just can't make something 18 metres long in timber perfectly straight. <coughs> so this is it, finished and well, got quite pleased with it. I'm just going to show a couple of images. This is a slightly wacky bridge we're working on at the moment in Ghent. It's called Water Sports Barn. This is a, this is a lake that's a kilometre long and <coughs> about 80 metres wide and it's used for um, water sports races. And um, so th this is a 90 metre long clear span foot um, cycle bridge and the architect's called Peter Daislier and he's based in Ghent, quite a young architect, and he looked at all sorts of bridge typologies. He didn't want this to be a normal bridge typology, so that's why the mast is this very strange shape. It goes straight up and then it comes across at an angle and then down again. And it just picks up um, the deck at, at the third points. So this is um, one of our drawings of it, you can see. So we're just in the middle of detailed design on this now. <coughs> and again, this is the, the geometry, working out how to fabricate that strange mast is quite difficult. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. And this is sections through the deck. So it goes from, uh, um, section one is um, the, the, the shallowest down to um, deeper in the middle. And the, the cycle lane is lower than the, the pedestrian lane, so they're separated. And then this is us doing various types of analysis at the moment. Another project we're working on, which is just on site, is um, with um, Field and Fowls. And this is for the Yorkshire S Sculpture Park, a new visitor centre and gallery. Um, and it's, um, it's nearer t to the, exit, the nearest exit off the motorway than the main um, gallery is. And it's kind of um, sheltered and partly dug into the, the it's basically limestone uh, and it's got um, at one end at this end it's got the gallery and then this end is more the visitor centre and cafe and um, film files were interested in using rammed earth in fact we looked at the at the earth that was on the site and it really didn't make sense to use it we would have had to have used, added so much to cement to make it strong enough so, in fact, what's been used is rammed concrete, and I'll show you another project we've been working on with rammed concrete, and they wanted it to have this sort of appearance. So, it, and, and these walls, in fact, are not uh, structural, they're more like the rain screen. And then this, these, these are views, it hasn't been built yet, but of, of the gallery, so it's got sloping concrete um, louvers pretty well to control light levels in the gallery. It's a temporary gallery. So it doesn't have to be to such stringent um, light levels as some galleries would be. And then at the, at the other end of the building, <coughs> it's timber. So these are solid, solid um, timber cruciform columns supporting uh, solid timber beams. And these are our drawings. So it's concrete up to the ground level and also there are concrete retaining walls on these two sides because it's dug into the ground a bit. And then we've got the timber columns at this end. We've got blockwork walls and blockwork walls here. So it's got, it is a lot, a lot of mixture of materials. And then this is the roof plan. So we've got, um, this is the, the concrete. You, know, you can see it better on that image there, the concrete louvers there. And I'll just show you a few of the, this, they use this, this bit of wall, which is going to be covered up as a trial for, for how they would do the, um, the rammed concrete. And so you can actually see that's that's where it's going. That's that is going to be how the finish. Where's and then I'm going to quickly talk about some of the living architecture houses, not all of them. So we we were very lucky to be involved in all of the ones except for the temporary one uh, that's on top of the Queen Elizabeth Hall. So Alan de Botton had this idea: how come the British public don't want to buy modern houses, whereas you know on the continent or in the states that's what everyone would aspire to. And he said, well, maybe it's because people don't really experience modern houses. They experience 
civic modern buildings, but not, not at the smaller scale. And he said if they stayed overnight, so if he built some holiday homes, this might encourage people. And so he asked a collection of good architects to design um, to design buildings. So this one is, uh, was done by MVRDV and th their idea was to have a house that would cantilever out a long way. And actually when I went to Rotterdam I understood where their architecture was coming from. They're, they, they're quite brave about putting quite mad buildings on top of other buildings and they ship whole buildings on big cana uh, can canal barges. So it's kind of very much in keeping. The thing about a cantilever, if it's steel, we looked at uh, making it a virandil, so just having square holes on the side, but that made it very expensive because you need a lot more steel for a virandil than if you put diagonals in. So, so basically, it's a truss, it's a steel truss that's a tube, and then um, uh, Winnie Mass, I think this is their sense of humour, he's covered it all in plywood, so it looks like a timber truss, but it isn't. So this is the steel structure. We worried about whether, about um, again, whether it'd be too lively at the end. The bedrooms are <coughs> on on the side that's not cantilevering. There's one bedroom that's cantilevering a bit, and we discussed whether it would be un, uh, kind of unnerving because it, clearly you can't make this infinitely stiff. So so it, it, it would vibrate a bit. So we designed it so you could put dampers in at the end. <coughs> in fact, when it was at this stage, it was a bit bouncy at the end. But then once all the cladding went in, Alan went and jumped in. He said, no, it's all right. Here's, so here's the, um, here's the truss elements all clad in plywood. That's uh, Chris in our office jumping and me taking a picture of him. So you could feel it. <coughs> it's got this kind of... Um, it's got a door here that opens up so you can get into the undercroft and, it's, and it lifts up, it's a bit like that, um, well, like one of those cartoons and it has, it has, a, has to have a piston to open it because it's so heavy. And it's, and it's all clad in this um, uh, stainless steel so it reflects the colours around. And then this one, uh, um, Thoughtness, um, is um, designed by Nord so it's, un sorry, by JVA, the um, Norwegian firm of architects. And it's kind of an upside down house. So you only see the, the glass at the bottom. There's actually a concrete core with the stairs um, in the middle. And then this is a concrete floor plate that cantilevers out so that the corners can be opened up. And then this top level is all made of cross laminated timber. So that's like mega thick plywood and it all was cut beforehand so and brought to site so it could be that was all fitted perfectly and could be put up in just two days uh, so that's inside you can see this this is the the concrete core which itself cantilevers out over the fireplace this is us having an office meeting and us <laughs> basking in the sun And then you've probably seen pictures of this one. This is um, this was Fat and um, Grayson Perry, and I mean it's not rocket science engineering wise, but it, it's fiddly because it's um, it's it's a blockwork structure. But then the roof is um, steel, so steels had to be bent into these little shapes um, with with timber connecting it all together. So it's more that was fiddly, and luckily they got very good um, builder to make it. Um, and the, ma the idea behind this one was that Grayson wanted to do um, um, uh, something that would be a, a, a chapel for anybody. So it's got two bedrooms and then it's got this one room which actually has very good acoustics. I'm going to have to really flick because I'm a gun over time. <laughs> um, this is um, one with um, Peter Zumptor and we've been working on this for years and years. Bit of a nightmare. Um, it's, the idea is the, it, it, this is a, in Devon, and the idea is the um, Stonehenge standing stones in a way. <coughs> so the thing about it is that it's concrete inside and out. The main room is just supported in a few points and has to be one layer of concrete and another layer above it with insulation in between. And the top layer cantilevers up to five metres beyond the glazing line. That's the glazing line. So it makes for a very heavy cross-section. So at, 
at the glazing line, we've got the bottom slab as thin as we can make it, which is 200, and then we've got uh, 200 of insulation, which means that that concrete is a minimum of 600 deep, in places goes up to at least a, a metre deep. So it means it has very heavy foundations. So this is just a warning. If you want something to be concrete inside and outside, it's going to be very heavy. <laughs> and the walls similarly, and we had to work out how to analyse one, one plate sitting on top of insulation on top of a bottom plate. <coughs> so we modelled the insulation with lots of springs. And then you've got the two layers deflecting differently. And this is also looking at the top, how it would drain. So that's partly what led to the extra thickness that we needed. So it all has to slope to the edges. Anyway, this is, uh, the walls are made of rammed concrete. And there are two layers of walls with insulation between. And that's it going up. That's the formwork to support that very heavy roof. <coughs> so then, because concrete creeps, that means it settles over time. We said that the concrete had to be um, cast and sitting there for at least six months before they measured the glazing, because we didn't want the glass to be ending up supporting the roof. And as, unlike on um, Zaha's um, Maggie Centre, where we could use the mullions to prop the roof, Peter didn't want us to do that. So there will be mullions, but they're not going to be supporting the roof. Eventually, hopefully, it'll be very beautiful. Now, um, this is the Young Vic Theatre. This was one of the early projects um, that we did in JWA, and it's with Hayworth Tompkins. This was the original um, <coughs> theatre that was um, um, it's about f designed about 45 years ago as a temporary structure. So it's just one layer of block work and with the structure on the outside. So terrible acoustically and thermally. And there were all sorts of problems with the building, and it wasn't very efficient. So there was a competition to rebuild it. But there was an awful lot of love for the uh, old entrance and this <coughs> butcher shop, which was the only building left standing after the site was bombed during the war. So, and there was also a lot of love for the auditorium. So <coughs> House Tompkins' idea was that we would clad the auditorium in another layer, also put a new roof on it, so raise it, and we could have trusses there that people can walk in, so give a technical gallery as well. So this is a kind of study model of the competition entry. And we also added a um, new level here. So, that, so the double height bar and foyer <coughs> space also has a balcony here, which looks out over the cut. And this has really rejuvenated the cut. So it's been a real regeneration project. Um, this just is a ground floor plan, just showing the only bits that were kept were the butcher shop, just the walls. We put new floors and roof on it. And then the auditorium walls which was supported by a raft, so not a deep foundation at all, <coughs> which had rotated ever so slightly by about 75 millimetres one side to the other. So we didn't want to put vertical load on it, but we used the box to provide stability for the new steelwork around it. So you can see the trusses there, which you can walk in. And then we've got a new um, scenery <coughs> workshop here, and we put a big hole in that wall so that actually this can also be used as a proscenium arch and a bit of stage there. And that's the section the other way. And we actually put in a new gallery that's hung from the new roof. And this is a plan on the roof trusses. And actually, the middle bit can be removed. So that's the steelwork that was added without its own stability, because it's hooked onto the, the box. And on this side is the big opening that we put in. <coughs> So that's, that's the trusses sitting on top of another truss above the opening. And this is it finished. And this, the seats are an exact replica of what was there before. So the feel of the theatre is exactly as it always was, which I think is why it's been so successful. But then all the back of house is much better organised. <coughs> and that public foyer is brilliant. Before there was just like a very skinny cafe, about 10 foot wide, which went along the front. Sorry about overrunning. <laughs> Uh, this is one, uh, the other, uh, there's a new studio at one end, and this is very simple concrete frame with block work infill, and the concrete's got unistruts cast into it, so things can be attached to it anywhere. So this is like a real black box type of theatre. 
and that's the double height four year space. The budget was very tight, it was under seven million, which meant that there's very little applied finishes, which in a way is quite nice for us because it meant all the details had to be <coughs> as beautiful as possible, all the connections. So if you ever go there, study all the connections. And that's looking out over the cut. So definitely this, and this was again a project of collaboration. David Lamb, the director of uh, The Young Vic, which I think he's just recently left, but um, was a main driving force behind the project. And then just to finish with this tiny theatre next to Earlsfield Station called Tara Arts, which again had a, a brilliant client, um, who, Jatinda, who was just passionate about it. So there always was, a t there was, for a long time, there's been a very small theatre that only seated, I think, about 50 people behind this facade. Um, the ar architects are, um, um, oh my God, <laughs> senior moment, uh, 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 the arts team, um, and uh, Julian Middleton was the project architect on it. And, um, in fact, the whole building has been rebuilt, but we, we, we reclaimed the bricks. And it's, it's a very nice theatre now. It seats 100. Chitinda really wanted to have an earth floor for the stage. So the, the stage, which is, isn't very big, I think it's about six metres by six metres, and it's, and it's basically in a tray, and it's got earth with, with a varnish on top. And the actors just love being on it, and they can dance and play. And then it's, at, it's unusual for an auditorium that it's got um, windows which have screens that get pulled across to black it out. So it means when people are rehearsing, they can have some daylight. This is actually looking up to the, the um, there's a rehearsal room there. And then this is looking up to the outside. And then this is the technical gallery. So that's looking into the technical room. And this is um, the earth floor with someone dancing on it. And this, they had this opening party, which was great. So I'm ending on that slide because it was a very happy day. Oh, oh, sorry, one more slide. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what I'm really ending on, which is to come full circle to other things, other ways. And this is all about collaboration as well. So twice a year I go to Venice and I sing with this group of instruments and uh, musicians. <coughs> And you know, to go back to mindfulness and being in the moment and just working together, I think um, is the most important thing to remember. Thank you.